Okay. Good morning. Uh, so uh, today's lecture, we are going to uh, learn an important uh, uh, crash test called the rollover crash test. So we have studied in our vehicle dynamics course uh, this rollover phenomena. Uh, what is the condition that this rollover phenomena can take place? So you see that the suspension roll in rollover of a vehicle is what uh, we had one of the lecture in our vehicle dynamics class where the role of axle and role of uh, your sprung mass would cause um, the, thresh, uh, the possibility of a rollover scenario uh, during the vehicle motion. So we had derived an expression for uh, threshold value uh, of uh, lateral acceleration. Uh, at that acceleration or beyond that acceleration, the rollover cannot be prevented. So this particular topic we have studied, uh, especially when we talk on vehicle stability, is concerned. So uh, today's this particular topic of rollover crash is uh, uh, um, taking us to the uh, point of vehicle dynamics, wherein we focus on unstable state of your vehicle, right? So stability issues are uh, looked at in your vehicle dynamics course. You'll see this rollover uh, uttered many times. So we had uh, done two types of uh, uh, unstable state of the vehicle. One is your plane unstable state another one is this rollover state so your plane unstable state is maybe the poor road condition the grip of the tire on the road is not good and then drifting of rear axle so the vehicle uh, spin about an z axis and uh, it goes uh, uh, uncontrollable uh, by the driver so the st steering action is lost uh, no more uh, uh, capability of steering of your vehicle is what was uh, uh, resulting into uh, the unstable state of yaw spinning uh, of your vehicle on the road. And that is yaw plane uh, uh, unstable state. So another one is the rollover unstable state. So these two in vehicle dynamics course we have uh, studied in detail. Uh, and uh, uh, we are going to look at in today's lecture uh, uh, further or just to highlight an important uh, issues that are involved in rollover. And then we will see how this rollover crash test has been conducted. It is not an easy uh, crash test uh, similar to that of uh, what we have seen uh, in uh, other uh, um, topics like uh, uh, frontal um, uh, impact test or side impact test and so on. Because there the repeatability of the test is uh, possible, whereas in rollover test, the repeatability was question mark. So if you are unable to prevent this rollover and it happens in an accident uh, scenario, so what was the protection uh, to be ensured for how the protection can be uh, protection can be ensured for the occupant is what is the question mark. So that comes from the roof strength of the uh, vehicle because the rollover happens, the vehicle rollover. So you see that um, all four tires seeing sky and then a roof on the ground and then it is rolling uh, 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 in number of times. So at that time, uh, the crushing of your roof should be uh, uh, prevented. And uh, the restraint system inside uh, the cabin uh, or the vehicle should be such that it should protect, uh, uh, you no know, hold the occupant uh, getting heated with the uh, interiors of the vehicle and avoiding injury. So this is something, uh, what is the rollover uh, protection uh, that go into that. So most of the time, if you see this roll rollover crashes, the accidents, uh, the occupants will be thrown out of the vehicle. So they will be ejected from the vehicle. So these are all something that we one can witness from many videos. So today we are going to have a, a, a class so that we'll can completely understand this uh, rollover phenomena. Uh, and this rollover crash test and so on, right? So that's the objective. And how can we prevent? What are the measures that are taken by highway authority uh, when uh, vehicles are ridden on highways uh, to prevent such kind of rollover crash test? Particularly, you see, there are barriers across uh, um, uh, um, along the highways. On the sides, it was made so that uh, the barriers would protect the vehicle not tripping over. So the rollover is normally happens with the two phenomena. One is tripping phenomena, another one is untripping phenomena. What are those all? Let us just look at in today's class. So let me just uh, share my slide.
So you are able to see this uh, active inspire board of mine. Uh, we are at lecture number eight of our course in module two, and today's uh, topic of lecture is rollover crash. So what is this rollover and how does it occur? A rollover is a type of vehicle crash in which the vehicle tip over onto its side or roof. And it can continue, right? Rollovers are very dangerous and have a higher fatality rate than other types of vehicle pollutions. Uh, vehicle rollovers are divided into two categories. One is the stripping, tripping and untripping. So what causes tripping and untripping? So tripping rollovers are caused by forces from an external object such as a crub. A crub is an obstacle or a collision with the other vehicle. So there can also be a, a sand pit or a, a, no, it can go into digging into the sand and then uh, uh, can roll when it goes out of the road, off road when it goes. So this is something called a, a tripped rollover. What are untripped rollover. These untripped rollover crashes are very uh, uh, vital and uh, uh, which is uh, actually uh, referring to an unstable state. That's all under the loss of control of the driver. So it's a result of steering input. You would be giving uh, um, so severe uh, steering input in a very hard cornering. At that time, there can be a chance of uh, um, development of uh, lateral acceleration is going beyond the threshold so that can make your vehicle to uh, um, uh, tip uh, trip so the rollover can start and the speed at which the vehicle is driven the road adhesion coefficient that's friction on the ground these are all some of the reasons so you could see in this figure uh, the vehicle which comes uh, goes off the road and it is on the off-road path and then a driver gives the steering and then he is trying to take the vehicle inside the road so the steering input to enter the roadway was so uh, uh, it was unable to be controllable. So loss of directional control due to the excessive correcting steering. So the uh, uh, judgment of uh, requirement of uh, correcting steering is not happened. And that's why you see this uh, um, uh, loss of uh, uh, directional control and that is taking the vehicle to uh, spin or can roll over. So this is an important mechanism. Uh, uh, through which uh, uh, it can happen. So, uh, continuing with that, if you look at the untripped rollover physics, what is it? So, untripped rollover uh, occurs when uh, cornering forces <coughs> destabilize the vehicle. That means uh, the forces acting on the vehicle are destabilizing. It is not ensuring the equilibrium of the vehicle. So, that is what is happening. So, what are those important three forces? There are three, three forces. You know, there are three forces. So what are those? The one is centripetal force that is necessary to be developed with the tire contact and because of which uh, you get a um, vehicle to go on a covered path. And then inertial effect that is centrifugal force because of the mass of the vehicle which is outward acting and the gravity that is weight of the vehicle. So the cornering force from the tire pushes the vehicle towards the center of the car. This force act on a ground level below the center of mass. The force of inertia, where is it acting? It is acting at the center of the mass, away from the center of the torque. So that forms a couple and that makes the vehicle to uh, um, be uh, pulled, rolled out of the car. These two forces make the vehicle roll towards the outside of the car. The force of the vehicle's weight act outward through the center of mass in the opposite direction. So instead of falling on inside of the tire, it goes to the outside of uh, the outer wheels. Then uh, um, uh, the, the event of rollover takes place. When the tire and the initial forces are enough to overcome the force of gravity, the vehicles start to turn over. So this is what does that importantly happening? Those three forces uh, uh, have uh, making that untripped rollover uh, of the vehicle. <coughs> So if you look at that, what I was telling is this. So you see, this is that vehicle axle uh, represented. The CG height of the vehicle is somewhere located here. So you see there is a centrifugal force and you see there is a centripetal force, the sum of this, right? And you have this weight is balanced by this. So this is a simple free body diagram of um, the um, uh, wheels. 
considering they are matched together. If you see that, uh, that is taking you to an overturning speed. So what is given by that simply by balancing of this moment. So overturning moment is equal to the stabilizing moment. So what is overturning moment? Overturning moment is, so here the curve path the vehicle is to go on this left turn. So this is the velocity. So overturning moment is because of centrifugal force acting at CG. Uh, of course, in this diagram, suspension effect is not brought in. We have done in detail uh, in our vehicle dynamics course. But uh, even this is sufficient enough to understand those three forces, right? So this and uh, the summation of FA and FB, that forms a couple. And this weight would uh, be migrating and outward. And um, what would happen? See, this RB into D by 2 is what is that at the time of tipping, there is uh, no contact of this. So you'll have only this RB into D by 2 is what is stabilizing moment. So when they are equal, you are able to get a velocity and that is what is the uh, uh, velocity called overturning speed. And that overturning speed uh, beyond which the um, vehicle would uh, roll over. So it's simple. So where here R is what is the radius of your uh, path. So it is at uh, very far away. This is R. And what is uh, um, in this G is uh, 9.81. D is the track width. This is D. Uh, sometimes it is also notated by other textbook by T. And H is what is CG height. So this is what is a simple uh, 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 free body diagram to understand um, uh, this uh, aspect, right? And then uh, you see how can we this overturning speed may be increased. The speed can be increased means this is the speed at which that would happen. That's why it's called. If I increase the speed, that means I can have uh, vehicles still would be ridden with the higher speeds, right? So that would be lowering the CG height. So uh, the rollover phenomenon normally happens in the vehicle where the location of CG are high. Example, compared to sedan class vehicle, you look at CG of SUVs are more uh, higher and uh, buses and trucks, those uh, CGs are uh, elevated from the ground. So those vehicles can easily get uh, this rollover uh, problem. But uh, if you are able to lower the height, CG height, uh, we can increase this overturning speed and increasing the wheel tread. So the design aspect of wheel tread cannot be just like increased uh, so that can go into more of optimization of design. But uh, uh, looking at this factor, what causes the increase in uh, uh, overturning speed, if you see? So decreasing D, <coughs> decreasing D, uh, sorry, increasing D, increasing R, and decreasing H is what is uh, uh, evidently from this equation uh, uh, would uh, uh, increase the overturning speed. And the vehicle design aspects that influence over. Uh, rollover. So all vehicles are susceptible to rollover to various extents. So what are those? If you look at the height of the center of mass, just now we have looked at narrowness of uh, axle track, that's D. If it is very small, then uh, the tendency of rollover would be more. If it is wider, then the tendency is smaller. Uh, the tendency uh, would not happen. So overturning speed can be increased. Then the steering sensitivity, so uh, the steering action of your vehicle, uh, uh, you will have a controlled uh, steering capability during uh, hard cornering or high speeds and then uh, increased speeds. So these are all. So uh, what are these four factors? These four factors are influencing the tendency of uh, rollover. Right. So the smaller the height is better. If height of the center of mass is more than uh, the tendency is very uh, uh, much uh, in the vehicle and uh, smaller the axle track is uh, uh, those vehicle will be more easily get into rollover problem and uh, smaller uh, steering sensitivity uh, and uh, um, uh, and an increased speed of the vehicle these are all the uh, reasons so these are all some of the uh, um, uh, values uh, with regard to class of vehicles the rollover threshold of passenger car uh, is over 1G of lateral acceleration. The Tesla S model has an unusually uh, low rollover risk of 5.7% due to its low center of mass. 
Light trucks will uh, roll over at a lateral acceleration of 0.8 to 1.2 Gs. Large commercial trucks will roll at a lateral acceleration as low as 0.2 Gs. See, uh, look at this small value here compared to a passenger car. Trucks are more likely to roll over than a passenger car because of they usually have taller bodies and higher ground clearance. This rise the center of mass. So why SUVs also are put in this category is because uh, especially those outfitted with the long travel off road suspension. So you have long travel off road suspensions. So the uh, suspension uh, uh, space is more there. Right. That is why. Uh, um, the increased suspension height and increased clearance half. Uh, um, uh, increased clearance off road rises the center of mass. So these are all some of the reasons are uh, the design aspects that go into the vehicle uh, that influence the rollover. And rollover occurrence conditions if you look at again uh, uh, it is like traveling at high speeds on curved road, severe cornering maneuver, traveling on collapsing road and suddenly providing steering input to a vehicle with a low level of roll stability, uh, losing control due to rapid uh, decrease of friction, such as uh, driving on an icy road or greasy road, uh, laterally sliding of the uh, road. So that is what wheel lock and lateral uh, sliding, yaw print stability that we are talking on, and sliding from a cliff. So of course, when you are uh, down cliff and you are coming, there are more uh, chances that a rollover uh, can occur. And stability of vehicle, when you see, these are very important. So some metrics that have been developed to evaluate the static and dynamic stability of vehicle. What are those? One is static stability factor, which we have studied uh, in our vehicle dynamics, and tilt table ratio, and critical sliding velocity. So what are these? So look at now, this is the vehicle I have. This is my track, and this is my hatch. So you have your uh, lateral acceleration, Ay, is simply given by T by 2 H is what is called uh, static stability factor. So during the steady state, if the vehicle uh, acceleration is equal to T by 2 H, that's on wedge of uh, rollover. So this is the first assessment uh, of any vehicle that you see. If a vehicle subjected to lateral acceleration during hard cornering, uh, T by 2 H uh, values, then uh, you would have uh, so it is in measure in G's when uh, the vehicle would have um, uh, rollover issue. So uh, we have seen that 1 G time it is. So T by 2 H is the same as, so T is track and H is this. So the height is so low, the 2 H is smaller than this, then uh, what would happen? If the track with this uh, uh, T by 2 H, right? That's T by 2 H. So here, uh, uh, this AY is 1 G for a passenger car. So anything that go beyond 1 G uh, would uh, make this to have um, uh, uh, rollover uh, uh, threshold. So it's called the static stability factor is because it is steady state. Uh, during steady state motion, this is the first uh, assessment. And then you see uh, there's a tilt table ratio. So tilt table ratio comes here. So if this is the CG location, the total weight can be resolved into two component. One is uh, this, another one is this. So this is uh, uh, the weight. So uh, this angle, whatever is there, is same as that of this angle. So if this is my weight W, and what is this is going to be? This is going to be W cos theta and W sine theta. So the tan theta is what is this angle? So that would be uh, the so this force here at CG would be what is that is centripetal uh, force, and uh, this force is what is weight component. So the angle theta tan theta would have centripetal acceleration by G. This is a simple one, and this is what is called a tilt table ratio. And if your uh, uh, road profile or uh, section is like this banking of roads so going beyond and this is that it's there and a smaller obstacle here. See this is a crumb or uh, here that would make the vehicle to uh, turn over. 
So that is what is tilt table ratio that's called. And then uh, critical sliding velocity. So critical sliding velocity is again uh, whenever uh, you have your AY value greater than this static stability factor. And then uh, when it is hit on the scrub, uh, uh, then you would have this rollover uh, uh, would happen. So the CG would go like this and uh, this happens. So you can see here another picture where uh, when this tire is striking on this obstacle here, when it is sliding and striking and then it takes a turn and uh, you see that uh, uh, at this speed uh, you would have um, unstable state, rollover state. So what was that corresponding uh, acceleration? That would be greater than uh, this D by 2H, right? Yeah. So these are all something that go into the uh, uh, details of uh, rollover uh, phenomena in a vehicle, which is an unstable uh, state uh, um, or a stability problem issues. So we will now uh, watch some of the videos to confirm um, the severity, uh, how dangerous this rollover uh, test, uh, looking at some accident scenarios, and then we will see how this uh, uh, authorities, uh, National Highway Safety Standards or IAHS, uh, they, are, they are the leaders to make certify the vehicle crashworthiness. We have been watching and uh, going through the documentation of those agencies uh, to understand our course. And we will watch some of the videos and uh, how this uh, vehicle roof strength is measured uh, so that uh, during rollover, uh, condition which you can which needs to be prevented in case it cannot be prevented how can you do that and also this rollover uh, can be um, prevented uh, not only by a passive safety system uh, restraints in the vehicle also by uh, an active safety system like an electronic stability uh, uh, program uh, 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 you can have uh, this sliding velocity critical sliding velocity can be um, increased uh, so that uh, um, you will not have uh, um, rollover phenomena that takes place or an unstable state in the airplane can be prevented. So these are all something uh, that we will witness through videos and confirm and that is how I, I would like to end our uh, lecture today. So uh, let's uh, now go for listening to those videos. So let me share. of this so let us let's just look at uh, uh, this uh, rollover crash which is common news uh, uh, and uh, the people could escape from the rollover and though it is very very dangerous event so let's just look at and how uh, severe is it is that let's watch so you are not able to uh, view that i love to um, Share my video file. So, hope uh, you are able to see this screen and uh, let's. Wild crash in Grant County. Look at this. All five people somehow survived this, including a five year old boy after being tossed around and out of an SUV during a rollover crash on the interstate. The dash cam video taken by a Wisconsin truck driver right behind them. That crash happened on northbound 75 near mile marker 162. WLWT News 5's Brian Hamrick spent the day in Grant County. Brian. Yeah, Mike. Well, the crash sends an SUV flipping five times. Four people were ejected, but the most amazing part of this crash is what people find as they race to help the victims. This is the aftermath of a vehicle flipped. It's, it's devastating. And lives turned upside down. But every detail in this crash is caught on camera. The truck that was following the, uh, the vehicle actually had a dash cam. Grant County Sheriff Chuck Dills shows us the vehicle to watch as this Mercury Mountaineer. It swerves across traffic off the road and flips over and over. Watch again. The vehicle's in the left-hand lane. Then it veered across three lanes. The driver loses control and look closely as it rolls. You can actually see the people being ejected. The first one is thrown out here. 
Then the second person is tossed as the vehicle goes over top, and it happens again as the driver is ejected. What's harder to see? The youngest victim, a five-year-old, is trapped underneath. People rush to help, but it will take emergency crews to get him out. But the most amazing part of the entire crash... It's very amazing how they did survive. Everyone lived. The child underneath the vehicle suffered two broken legs, but those were the most severe injuries after a wreck that went end over end before it ever ended. And when you look at that, it is amazing anyone, much less everyone, survived this crash. Now, uh, drugs or alcohol were not a factor in this crash. They say it was driver inattention, texting or just talking to someone in the vehicle. Reporting live, Brian Hemrick, WLWT News 5. All right, Brian, thank you. That driver is James Chandler of Covington. He did not have insurance and was not supposed to be driving that vehicle. So we could uh, see how severe accident it was. And uh, the reason for the accident is um, uh, the driver uh, during drive is not focusing on his drive, rather is to talk on the phone or someone. So that has made uh, the uh, disturbance of his drive. And uh, you could see that the entire rollover has taken place because of the gentle hit of uh, the vehicle on a uh, truck ahead, uh, gently at the rear. So that's what has happened uh, all of a sudden, um, your vehicle to roll over. And that's on one side, and the severity of rollover is very dangerous. Uh, fortunately, in this particular video captured on the news, uh, is uh, um, uh, evident that uh, people can get saved by God. So they have saved and then uh, vehicle uh, um, uh, ejected them and then uh, and they were able to survive. Uh, so this is what something that we see that also it gives an important lesson that any time our vehicle should have an insurance uh, for any kind of claim that is there. So that was not insured and uh, we may not uh, be able to have the uh, claim act. So this is all something that we could uh, um, understand from the um, uh, video that we have watched. And you see, importantly, uh, uh, of our course is concerned, uh, you see a smaller uh, tap from rear, right? So that could be visualized like a gentle offset uh, um, uh, frontal crash can take the vehicle to roll over. So we exactly have witnessed that in the uh, uh, last, uh, but before class, uh, crash test that has been conducted in IIHS uh, uh, offset uh, frontal crash mode. Uh, Jeep uh, uh, Wranglers crash test. So you could see that uh, uh, that is gentle offset crash test made the Jeep to roll over and that fails in the test. So you see the cause of rollover uh, is not only uh, uh, gentle driving stability, um, stable state and whatever that factors that we have seen. Those are all the mechanisms, the physics behind, but it can happen uh, uh, with very complex phenomena in no time uh, uh, such uh, rollover crashes can happen. So that's what we witness. Uh, so uh, this topic is very important uh, as far as uh, vehicle safety uh, development is concerned. The rollover aspect should be taken care. So let's watch uh, some additional videos now. Uh, the Volvo rollover crash test. So that's very interesting. How do they conduct this rollover test? Are you able to hear the audio? Yes, sir. Yeah.
what we have watched is just a one minute video graph, right? So you see that uh, uh, it is a slow motion video. It's not uh, that event would have gone for that. It's a slow motion video and uh, uh, see that uh, how the test was carried out. So it has been brought by a carrier uh, where the vehicle has been um, uh, kept. So let's watch once again. It's interesting how that test is begun, right? Dummies on the uh, sea, and uh, uh, there is no airbag. So, if airbag is deployed, or uh, at that time the dummies would have been held intact, uh, and the roof is not crashed, so uh, there would be avoidance of serious injury or fatal uh, cause in the rollover uh, test. So, you could see that has been done on an open. Uh, um, uh, uh, track uh, space of test track and the many uh, people test executors others are witnessing this test so it's nice uh, video and uh, also let's go worth to watch the remaining part of this video uh, wherein it is a kind of uh, uh, looking at uh, how on this vehicle uh, the different mode of um, crash test that we have so far learned have been conducted so let's uh, continue watching this video The full frontal cast. So what we witness in this is uh, see how uh, uh, nicely the frontal portion of the vehicle get crashed uh, and uh, um, it's because of the crumbling zone that is present in the uh, front portion and you could see the very very smaller uh, displacement of the axle at the rear side and um, maximum damage to the front that takes away almost every uh, kinetic energy. So it may be almost close to the perfect crash that you have seen. So the perfect crash is the one when it strikes the barrier and stays there itself. And, uh, in, uh, and that, is, that is what something that we are able to witness in this vehicle. Uh, and also how well the um, uh, restraint system inside the vehicle were acting. Uh, so the in-time deployment of your airbag and then restrained um, um, uh, uh, dummies by belts, uh, so they, there's very, very minimal injury uh, that, uh, that would have gone, right? Uh, let's continue watching. You can also see so much. And uh, see here, there is a, a transparent uh, floor pit, uh, so there will be bottom side cameras, lighting, so that uh, uh, complete uh, uh, the crash worthiness assessment uh, detail can be uh, taken. So that's all uh, going to the advancement of technology of um, uh, photography and image analysis further uh, that goes in. And see this front portion is just like uh, crushed nicely. Uh, like uh, there are some analytical uh, research work that go on material development of uh, crumbling zone. So you, the uh, axial load that has to act uh, 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 on the crumble uh, components 
uh, that has to make an axial uh, plastic deformation like a billow, billow tile, like it has to shrink together instead of bending it. So uh, as it goes like that and that will lead to a plastic deformation and that energy is absorbed. So it is something like uh, a box is just compressed in that fashion is what uh, clearly you could see from this uh, image that is now passed. So let's continue. In this video, you could see what how this uh, uh, front bumper and this crumbling zone, uh, the other thing as there. See, they are uniformly crushed. So it's a nice section uh, view. So uh, it's not a section view. How do you get this? Is see this camera? That is what is the transparent uh, um, base. Uh, when it strikes, you could see that uh, it's a bottom view captured through the bottom cameras. See how nicely uh, it is uh, showing. Uh, The head restraint system affects that uh, there is no more movement of uh, heads. Uh, They are back there. That, uh, So in this video, you could see that a uh, gentle offset of uh, um, your vehicle uh, crash has, uh, of course, uh, damaged the vehicle structure uh, to the large extent, but it's protected uh, uh, the cabin uh, because of the uh, restraints, the airbags present there, not only for a steering uh, airbag or side impact airbags and knee airbags, all have been uh, taking the driver intact. Uh, um, so uh, the injury level can be reduced. So that shows that uh, how much safety aspect that has uh, been taken care of by that vehicle. Uh, and we also have witnessed in another vehicle with the gentle offset has uh, failed and uh, uh, it was rolling over. So whereas uh, that rollover issues were not there in such uh, in a vehicle, right? So that is what is that uh, safety that goes into vehicle that we could uh, follow. So now we will also see uh, another video. Uh, the uh, rollover crash test can also be conducted through a ramp. So that will be made uh, run over a ramp, uh, one side axles, and then uh, the rollover uh, that's happening, right? So uh, we will see that uh, uh, video now. rollover crash test. Crashes that end in rollovers are rare but often lethal, claiming 10,000 lives each year. And the majority of people who are killed in rollovers are ejected from the vehicle, and the vast majority of the people who are ejected are not wearing their seatbelts. This is the General Motors rollover crash test facility, the first one of its kind owned by an automaker. Having the facility makes GM the first automaker to integrate rollovers into the variety of crash tests it does in-house at its Milford, Michigan proving grounds. Here, engineers will conduct about 150 tests each year. The importance of this 
crash test site where we can do research into rollover is that we can generate the data necessary for us to understand rollover crashes. GM will test several types of rollovers at this facility, including the corkscrew ramp rollover seen here. They're also working on sensors for airbags that keep people from being ejected out of their vehicles. The major difference between a, a rollover enable bag and just a side impact only bag is that a rollover bag stays inflated for up to five seconds, whereas a side impact bag inflates and deflates very, very quickly. There was a lot to learn about rollover crashes and the injuries that result from them. This facility and the work that is done here will go a long way toward helping to improve the understanding of injury mechanics and occupant protection. This facility will certainly help GM to better understand the dynamics of rollover crashes. For its part, GM says it will make rollover-enabled airbags standard on every one of its light trucks and SUVs by the 2009 model year and all of its retail vehicles by 2012. In Michigan, I'm Rose Tobiah. So, of course, this is not a very uh, older video, maybe before 2012. Uh, but this is given uh, this video I played to know how this crash test in the uh, indoor laboratory was conducted. Um, like uh, we have witnessed in a Volvo, uh, an outdoor uh, crash test uh, track it was conducted. So we also have nowadays uh, test rigs for conduct of this rollover test uh, where the vehicle would be made to um, spin and then uh, uh, the rollover scenarios can be then and those kind of uh, um, uh, rollover test rigs are called uh, uh, Jordan rollover system. There are uh, research papers on this uh, ro Jordan rollover uh, systems and how these tests were carried out. So these are all on one side. Let's again and watch in another video uh, where how this roof strength is measured. So it's a good video, very informative video of uh, Conduct a test of uh, predicting the roof crash strength. Crash strength, it is a roof crash. Strength. My name is Matt Brembelow. I'm one of the research engineers here at the Institute. And a big part of my job is to look at how people are dying or being injured in real crashes, and then to think about how those kinds of crashes could be incorporated into our test program here at the VRC. So a few years ago, one of the big projects that I started working on was to look specifically at rollovers. There are a few reasons that it's important to have a strong roof in a rollover crash. The main one is just to keep the survival space, the occupant compartment intact. You want to absorb the forces of the crash and the energy without having to deform the occupant space so that there's room inside for the restraints to do their job. Another reason it's important is a big part of the risk in a rollover is being ejected or thrown from the car as it's rolling. And if the roof stays in place, then the windshield and the side windows are more likely to stay in place as well and keep people in the vehicle. I'm Bo Jones. I'm a test engineer here at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety Vehicle Research Center. One of my main responsibilities is operating and maintaining the roof crush machine. In our roof crush machine, we measure the strength of the roof of a vehicle. In order to do that, our machine uses these hydraulic cylinders to push a steel platen into one corner of the roof. We crush the roof through five inches, and during these five inches, the platen moves at a fairly slow rate of about an eighth of an inch per second. In that stroke, we measure the maximum force that it takes to crush the car through these load cells. The maximum force recorded is then divided by the vehicle weight in order to come up with a strength to weight ratio. In our system of ratings, a vehicle must be able to achieve a strength to weight ratio of four or greater in order to receive a good. Our test has made a huge difference in the roof strengths of vehicles that are on the road. As we came out with our test and we required four times the vehicle's weight for a good rating, manufacturers started redesigning their vehicles very quickly. And we've seen a huge jump in the number of vehicles that we rate as good per roof strength. The best kind of rollover crash though would be the one that you don't get into. And manufacturers today are required to install a system on their vehicles, it's called electronic stability control. And this system is able to reduce the chances of you losing control of your vehicle and getting in the kind of situation that might lead to a rollover. 
And what we've seen is that when you take ESC and combine it with a strong roof, better airbags and seatbelt designs, that the rate of people dying and being injured in rollovers has gone way down. So this was another uh, nice video that uh, worked in to understand um, how uh, the vehicle uh, safety system and the vehicle um, roof strength that protect uh, um, the occupant during the rollover crash. So such kind of uh, um, uh, tests are become mandated now for um, ensuring uh, the uh, five star rating for the vehicles, right? So. These are all uh, something that go in. So how can we prevent? What are the actions that have been taken by roadways uh, authorities, highway authorities, uh, in uh, additional barrier built on that to prevent this kind of rollover accidents or any other type of accidents? Uh, also uh, are very important uh, to know such information. So let me play in another video and end with that uh, the lecture. Uh, wherein you will see that uh, uh, the barriers that are built on the sideways of the highways are uh, so important they uh, do save uh, many uh, lives. So let us uh, just to see one more uh, video. So how barriers stop killing the drivers? That's the title of that video. I used to think driving was getting more and more dangerous. And one reason is the media loves to sensationalize car accidents. Multi-car pileup in North Texas has killed at least six people. Incredible. And with those kind of stories, I was surprised by how the fatality rate has steeply dropped over the decades, even with more drivers on our roads today. We save more lives because of better seatbelt enforcement and catching intoxicated drivers. Cars are also safer with crumple zones, airbags, and ABS brakes. But did you know we've greatly improved the design and engineering of road barriers in the last 60 years, like this connection between a guardrail and concrete barrier? In the past, vehicles used to be crushed, but now they gracefully bounce off, and I'll tell you why later. We also removed these terminals from highways, which in the 60s made you look like a hot dog and replaced them with something far safer. My name is Andrew, and let's uncover how good road barriers have gotten to save more lives. Roadside safety equipment is made by different companies and their products undergo real life crash tests to prove their products work. In the United States, that standard has gotten more rigorous over time and the latest is MASH or the Manual for Assessing Safety Hardware. Compared to the older 1998 standard, MASH uses heavier vehicles, faster speeds and higher angles. MASH rated equipment has to be built better to handle the much higher impact forces. Europe uses a different standard, EN1317, but the safety principles are similar. In this video, I'll be focusing on MASH and how it's made our roads safer. MASH rated products have six safety ratings. The lowest is TL1, with higher ratings requiring products to stop heavier vehicles at faster speeds. The highest TL6 barriers that can stop tanker trucks are massive structures and rarely used on our roads today. For each level, all equipment has to pass three tests. Number one, it must keep the vehicle upright with no rollovers, which can cause severe injury to occupants, which means this product would fail and would need a redesign. Number two, the vehicle can tip more than 75 degrees or go over the barrier. That means this barrier does not pass mash testing. Number three, there could be no penetration or crushing of the passenger compartment and impact forces must be below the maximum allowed. All of this data is recorded and analyzed to figure out if a product fails or passes. MASH rated equipment has been mandated for new installations like this concrete barrier and is an important part of the safety system. Barriers prevent vehicles from driving into hazards like buildings, bodies of water and oncoming traffic. But crash barriers are themselves a danger. They're longer, closer and easier to hit, which increases the number of crashes, even though severe injuries and deaths are greatly reduced. It's far better to have vehicles run off the road into a safe area of land called the clear zone, which allows drivers to recover or reduce the severity of a crash. Engineers can create clear zones by removing hazards and grading the land according to guidelines, which covers things like the steepness and the width required. But it might not make financial sense, or it's not possible to create a large enough clear zone, which is when barriers can be used. These barriers come in three categories. 
concrete, guardrail, and cable. You often see concrete walls like this one. While it seems simple, there's some surprisingly well thought out engineering. If you look at their profile, many aren't vertical, but sculpted to reduce crash forces. One hit, your vehicle rides up the slope surface and this vertical motion dissipates energy, which reduces vehicle damage and impact on occupants. Unfortunately, this lifting motion can cause the vehicle to roll over under high speeds and impact angles. To improve this, engineers tested many shapes, and while the New Jersey barrier is popular, single slope and F-shape are better as they don't lift the vehicle as high, which increases stability and prevents rollovers. In comparison, vertical barriers minimize upwards movement. They're often used on bridges, as you don't want vehicles to be catapulted over the sides. Unfortunately, that increases impact forces and wheel damage, which can cause the vehicle to veer sharply into traffic. As well, higher lateral forces can push your head through the window, which can cause head slap and greatly increase your chance of dying. For those reasons, you mainly see slope barriers on highways today. Concrete walls are often used where you can't have any movement, for example, if it's close to a hazard. When there's more space, you'll often see a semi-rigid system instead. These can use a box beam, or more commonly, you'll see a flat corrugated guardrail connected to a wooden or metal beam for support. These are driven into the ground and often use a strong post system, which is quite ingenious. One hit, the posts rotate outwards and down, transferring kinetic energy through the soil, which reduces impact forces. As well, the rail detaches, so it stays at the right height and in contact with the vehicle, which also prevents tearing. On older designs, the rail is more likely to remain connected and can rip, letting the vehicle through. This tearing can also happen if the post can't easily rotate, which pulls down the rail. The new, safer mash rated guardrails only use a minor height increase and connection change versus the older rail to better contain heavier vehicles and prevent taller ones from jumping over the guardrail. It's also likely there's an offset block that keeps your wheels from snagging. This helps the guardrail improve stability and reduce sudden impact forces on occupants. Remember this guardrail and concrete connection I mentioned earlier? Engineers figured out they needed to add extra posts to prevent vehicles from being crushed. If the connection between the two is not reinforced, the guardrail bends and tears, with the vehicle smashing into the concrete face with horrific outcomes. Engineers added posts to stiffen the connection and allow the vehicle to bounce off as it was designed. Finally, we have cable barriers that are placed in medians to prevent vehicles from flying across and striking oncoming traffic. These have existed for decades, as you can see in this 1930s Missouri transportation video. Modern systems use three or four cables to safely catch vehicles and are under high tension to withstand multiple impacts and reduce movement. Unlike concrete or guardrail, there's some controversy with cable barriers. Critics say they're dangerous and only put in because of the low price. Transportation engineers argue they reduce serious injuries and could save more lives. Let's look deeper. Cable barriers are several times cheaper than concrete and 40% cheaper than guardrails because it uses fewer materials and lighter machinery, which reduces logistics, construction, and product costs. You can also install cable barriers on slopes, which saves money on landscaping. In comparison, concrete barriers can require heavy machinery, a sewage system, flat ground, troublesome logistics, and more time. The big downside with cable barriers is the greater vehicle penetration as it's easier to slip between the ropes. This is shown in two studies evaluating over 10,000 crashes which compared concrete, guardrail, and cable systems. From this, people say cable barriers are unsafe and cause way more deaths, but that's not completely accurate. In fact, these two large studies showed an equal or slightly higher fatality rate versus concrete. As well, what isn't mentioned enough is that cable barriers can reduce injuries. Cable barriers stretch when hit, which decreases injuries due to reduced impact forces. Both studies found a big reduction in total injuries. As well, the stretching helps prevent the vehicle from bouncing back into traffic and causing a second, more dangerous accident. More importantly, the lower price lets you build more cable barriers versus other types and the added length saves more lives. That's important as we don't live in a world with unlimited money and there are many construction projects and many miles of unprotected roadways. I could keep going, but this isn't a video about cable barriers versus the world. 
Instead, I wanted to show that each barrier has its benefits and drawbacks. To pick the right system, engineers weigh factors like traffic, volume, vehicle types, and landscape. So besides the barrier itself, at both ends, you often find a protective terminal like this one that saves drivers if they run into it. In the 60s, the state of the art was fishtail or spoon designs that tried to distribute the impact across more of the vehicle. These were widely used decades ago and were awful. Unfortunately, this acts as a spear when struck head on and can result in catastrophic injuries. In the late 60s, turned on ends were used, which bent the rail 45 degrees and buried it in the ground. These prevented spearing, but vehicles could easily vault or roll over, which caused serious injuries or fatalities. In the early 70s, various breakaway cable terminals like this one here were invented to minimize spearing. It works by having the end roll away with posts breaking off to redirect vehicles into a clear zone. These were used for 20 years, but phased out as they were too stiff for small vehicles and could still spear occupants. In this test footage, the guardrail smashes into the side of the vehicle and would dice up any occupants inside. Nowadays, we have energy absorbing terminals that let people walk away from highway speed crashes. For example, this is the MSKT, MASH Sequential Kinking Terminal System, and costs around 3,000 US dollars. All terminals, including this one, have to do two things. Protect occupants that hit it head on and anchor the guardrail. The MSKT would hit head on dissipates kinetic energy by crushing and kinking the rail while shooting it out the side. Its post and anchor are designed to break away safely as the head travels down the guardrail and slows and controls the vehicle. What I found impressive is the terminal has to do the exact opposite and provide tension when the rail is hit. The cable and ground strut keep the post and rail from being pulled down, which is called anchoring. Otherwise, the guardrail releases from the end post and the vehicle runs into the hazard. Also, if hit where the rail isn't strong enough to redirect vehicles, the MSKT safely lets vehicles through, which is known as gating. That's not a problem, as engineers add a clear zone behind it. While there are other terminals, I'm going to talk about one more because it's cool. This is the Trinity Soft Stop. When struck head-on, it crushes the guardrail vertically, pulls it through the impact head, and shoots it under the vehicle. You can see how the guardrail slides through the impact head as seen in this assembly video and what the rail looks like after it's been crushed. Not only does this keep the guardrail off the road, improving safety, but it keeps the rail anchored and maintains tension in the system. While the terminals for guardrails were fairly compact, I discovered these larger units are different. They're called crash cushions and are placed in front of fixed structures such as bridges, toll booths, and concrete barriers. Before crash cushions were created in the 80s, engineers used ramped ends, which produced dramatic and dangerous results. Nowadays, we use crash cushions in these three categories to safely stop vehicles, starting with sacrificial systems like sand barrels. These slow vehicles down through the transfer of momentum. They're arranged by weight from lightest to heaviest, so small vehicles can be gently slowed down and still protect heavier ones. These systems are cheap, around $3,000 for the parts, but anything hit needs to be replaced and it's messy to clean up. These are also useful for construction sites with one model using a metal sled that controls the vehicle as it crashes through the water-filled cartridges. There's also a mobile version that is mounted to the back of trucks that are used to protect road crews. Next, we have cushions like this Quad Guard M10 that are better for frequently hit locations. When hit, the steel structure collapses, but it's designed to survive and can often be reused by pulling it out with a truck. Afterwards, you have to replace the cartridges inside, which can cost around $900 each. Larger systems can use six of these, which can get expensive if hit often. For spots with many collisions, engineers use cushions that bounce back or can easily be reset when hit and requires less time and money to repair. There are many designs, but I found SCI's smart cushion particularly interesting. What's neat is the gas cylinder inside adjusts the stopping force based on weight and speed so cars and trucks have the right resistance. After an impact, the smart cushion can be quickly reset by pulling it out and replacing a few bolts. Other systems, like Traffic's compressor, use high-density polyurethane to absorb and bounce back after an impact. While restorable cushions can be double or triple the price of units that use replaceable cartridges, the repair costs are much lower and with enough crashes, restorable units save money in the long term. 
This is just one example of how engineers can maximize protection and justify how your money is spent. That brings us to how governments figure out how much money is worth spending to save your life or prevent a serious injury. Those values are called crash costs and are used to determine if safety improvement projects are economically justified. Engineers compared costs like adding a barrier to the benefits like saving your life to figure out what safety measures should be added. Governments value your life and limbs differently depending so we'll stop at this point as we are about to finish our lecture hour. And uh, see, uh, this uh, video, what we have seen is again another interesting um, aspect that going to ensure the traffic safety, uh, not a traffic safety, or the um, vehicle on the highway uh, safety. So we could see there are, uh, importantly, the barriers that are built uh, to avoid um, uh, very fatal uh, crashes like uh, rollover and they could uh, able to um, uh, secure the lives of the uh, occupant driver. And uh, importantly, we have seen uh, uh, three important uh, uh, barriers uh, that would be rigid concrete barrier or guardrail barrier and then cable carriers. So each one of them would be nicely explained uh, of their own merits and demerits. Uh, so, uh, you see that it is not uh, only the auto manufacturer, uh, automobile manufacturers do take care of the safety aspect. Also, it is an integrated uh, uh, government uh, actions that has to go in. So, the roadways, highways authorities, transportation um, people have to have a, um, appropriate uh, um, uh, safety measures like such barriers on the uh, highways. So we were able to witness that in Midwest uh, roadway safety facility. Uh, so such kind of facilities uh, are, are in, implemented, employed in uh, highways uh, that would uh, uh, decrease uh, many fatality uh, in road accidents. So with that note, I'm confident that uh, this one hour focused uh, attention on this particular lecture has brought in uh, the physics uh, and, and important aspects of uh, rollover uh, phenomena and, uh, um, and the safety measures that go into uh, uh, rollover crash. So with that note, I will stop today's class uh, if we do not have any more uh, doubts. So is that fine? I'll stop. I'll stop recording.